Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. My name is Pam Sador. It's so nice to see you all. Thank you all for coming. Tonight, author Chad Brescher is here to talk about his debut novel, The Lost Book of Wonders. Chad was born in Long Island, New York, the youngest of three sons, and from an early age, two things captivated him, science and literature. After studying to become a physician, attaining degrees from Brown University and Brown University School of Medicine, and later training at Harvard Medical School and Johns Hopkins Medical Center, he settled with his family right here in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Chad has completed his debut novel, The Lost Book of Wonders, it's a fast-paced thriller that brings together his interests in science, history, and religion. Brescher continues to write in his free time, I don't know where you find <laughs> being a father of children, okay. Uh, he continues to write in his free time, and he's now working on a sequel to The Lost Book of Wonders. So please welcome Chad Brescher to Radnor Memorial Library. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, it is pretty sensitive. Tell, tell me if I'm speaking too loudly. Um, the book, The Lost Book of Wonders, is my debut novel. It, it came out in April 2017. And during that time period, we sort of had the book launch at Main Point Books. The library is being renovated. So I always was interested in, in coming here and be able to speak to you folks. Uh, about the book and, and I really appreciate the opportunity as part of the Hometown Writers series to be able to do this. Um, to start off with, one of the things that have, has interested me since I was very young, my, basically my kid's age, was, was history. Um, but in particular, the mysteries in history, um, those, those sort of quirky sort of things that have happened uh, that nobody's been able to sort of solve. The other thing that interested me and I gravitated towards when I was a child were action, adventure, thriller type stories that really delve into these historical mysteries. So you think back when I was a child, it was Indiana Jones and his, his quest. You know, strong uh, characters that go on adventures that are able to amass clues and, and delve into these mysteries and, and, and solve something that has been a mystery for a while and, and has implications going forward. Or books like The King Solomon's Mine with uh, Alan Quartermain um, really interested me. And that's what my, my book, uh, my, my debut novel, The Lost Book of Wonders, as, as Pam was saying, is I wrote it to be a cinematic book. So when you're reading it, the chapters are, are short. Each chapter sort of ends as a cliffhanger, and you hopefully want to read the next chapter. But it also I spent a lot of time doing primary research on it so that the material in it, the, the kernel, the center of the book, is, is based on as much fact as possible. Um, to me, I wanted it to be both en entertaining but at the end of the day educational so that if I was successful, you'd read the book, be you know, excited about the adventure of it, but then when you completed it, you would want to jump on the internet and go Google about this, this particular site or this particular person, how much of it was true, how much of it was sort of, you know, stretched and more fictional. To me, that would be a success, and, and that's the kind of book that I, I, I enjoy. Uh, the central mystery of my book concerns Marco Polo. Now, I'm going to take an informal survey. Now, how many people, with a show of hands, have heard of Marco Polo? Okay, that's of no surprise. Um, Marco Polo arguably is the most famous explorer in the history of mankind. He is known, his name is known throughout the world, whether it's the Western Hemisphere or the Eastern Hemisphere. His name is synonymous with travel, with exoticism. Um, if you think about even the, the, you know, the kid's game of Marco Polo in the swimming pool, I mean, what is it really about? It's about exploration, it's about finding things. And, and he also had a really huge impact on people that came after him. And we're going to get a little bit into that. Um, I thought it would be first interested, instead of jumping to the book, everybody wants to jump to the book, um, I wanted to take a step back and give a little bit of a biography of Marco Polo, at least what, what we know of him, 
and I think it'll serve as a primer, a nice introduction to the book. So I prepared a little bit of a PowerPoint that will sort of go through some of this. And if anybody has any questions, um, please, you, know, you can interrupt me and please feel free to raise your hand and I will call on you. So the central question is who is Marco Polo? So this is a portrait of Marco Polo. Um, there are many portraits out there throughout the world. Um, I don't think anybody knows what Marco Polo looked like. There wasn't contemporaneous depictions of him. So you, know, you can basically guess what he looked like. Um, but to really understand Marco Polo, you really need to understand where he came of age and what time he came of age. And in particular, you need to really appreciate the role Venice played in the development of who Polo was. Venice, at the time of Marco Polo, he was born in 1254, was a superpower. We don't normally associate a small city as being a superpower in this day and age, but it was, it was about as big as he got. Um, there's a couple of reasons why that was the case. The most important was geography. Okay? It was located in, in Italy, what's now Italy, on, on the Adriatic Sea, and it was founded by seafarers. And they're not unlike in the ancient days, the Phoenicians were uh, the, 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 the people that sort of were seafarers that went around the Mediterranean. They were very similar um, in Europe. And it was founded, Venice, by seafarers that dug into the marshlands of Venice, made the canals that were all sort of we associate with Venice. Um, and they played a huge role in trade as well as moving people around. There was an event that occurred in 1099 that shaped Venice's role. It made it what it became as a superpower. And that was in 1099, the Christians con conquered Jerusalem during the Crusades. And the, Jerusalem had been in control, uh, had been controlled by the Muslims for 450 years. This was a big deal for a lot of reasons. It really shaped the world, and, and some people argue still shaping the world for what, what we have now. But one of the biggest things was that all of a sudden, the Middle East was open to Europe. Okay? And it allowed an interchange of cultures and an interchange of trade. And Venice was uniquely situated to be able to take advantage of that change. So they had the ships, they had the know-how know to take pilgrims and transport them from Europe and drop them off in the Middle East and take them back. They were already involved in trade, so they were able to take spice from one location or special cloth and linen and things of that nature. And we all know that if you are successful at trade, you're, you end up being very um, wealthy. So Venice became a very wealthy uh, power at that time, so wealthy that the Venetian gold ducat was the international currency at that time. Um, also the doge, who was it's kind of a unique figure. If you ever go to Venice, there's something called the Doge's Palace, which I definitely recommend visiting because it's amazing. But if you've ever seen pictures of, of Venice, they always show the Doge's Palace. It's just kind of that like classic photo they always have uh, along the water. Um, the Doge was essentially the king of Venice, but it was a titular head. He wasn't, he wasn't super powerful. He was the guy that they would trot out to sort of you know, meet the dignitaries. It was a very complex political system, and in my book we sort of delve a little bit into the background story of it, because the doge figures importantly in my story. Um, but there was a council and aristocrats, and they kind of held more power. But the doge theoretically possessed three-eighths of Constantinople. Now Constantinople, we now know as Istanbul in Turkey, was, a ver was also a very important city because it was always the gateway to the east. So literally, Venice owned three-eighths of that city. So they actually had a physical presence. Venetians lived in a Venetian area, a quarter, that was physically theirs and, and physically of their power. So they were just very uniquely you know, situated. So Marco Polo, he was either born in Venice or was born in the Crimea. The, the, the Polos had a family, um, a familial home in, in um, the Crimea. But most historians agree that whether or not he was born in Crimea or he was born in actual Venice, his, his formative years were spent in Venice. And this is a depiction of what sort of Venice looked like. Uh, it was a very bustling place. There was a lot of activity uh, with boats, and you can see sort of the, the canals that, that we know uh, now of. Niccolo and Mafio were uh, Marco's father and uncle. And he was born in a family of traders, as I said. 
When Marco was very young, around six years old or so, the father and the uncle, they leave. Okay, and they, and it, it, most likely the mother was, had, had, had died and he's being raised by family. Nobody knows 100%, but the, the mother's really not in the picture in terms of any description of him. Um, but these two important figures in his life leave and they leave and go east. And where they go is they go across the, the, into Asia, into what we call Central Asia, the steppes. The steppes are the plains of Central Asia where a certain culture lived, and that was the Mongols. The Mongols play a very important role in my book and really play an important role in, in, in history in general. What the, the Mongols were, were a group of unassociated tribes that lived in this area of Central Asia. They were amazing warriors, warriors that this world you know, has rarely seen in terms of their capabilities. They were incredible horseback riders in which they could shoot arrows, sitting side saddle, things that you know, other, other people could not do. They had, were incredible um, military geniuses in terms of how they approached battles. And they, they attacked in a way that Europe was never prepared for, they had never seen before. And they became very successful because of that. But in the early days, it was just a bunch of separate tribes that were competing amongst themselves. It was a nomadic culture. What happened was there was a, a guy named Genghis Khan, which I'm sure a lot of us have also heard about. His, he was really called Chinggis Khan. For some, it got corrupted at some point and, and Europeans started calling him Genghis Khan. He was able to unite all these tribes, and by doing so, he created this, this empire that was the largest land empire in the history of, of the world. So you think of Rome, gets a lot of attention. The Mongols had a larger land empire, and they did it essentially by just military prowess. They were brutal. They defeated basically everybody they fought to the point that they had extended all the, pretty far into Europe to the point that the Europeans really looked at them as an existential threat. They thought they were going to be wiped out by the Mongols. And the reality is they probably would have been wiped out by the Mongols if certain things had not occurred to direct the attention of the Mo Mongols inward. Um, but they were, they were, they defeated the, the, uh, the lauded uh, knights of Georgia, which apparently were fantastic knights that, that they just wiped them out. When they fought against the Muslims, they, they, wiped, they wiped them out as well. So they were very, very feared. So we have these two individuals, so we have Marco's father and uncle literally trekking across the, 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 plain, the uh, steps to go trade and barter with the Mongols. And we've heard of this, you might have heard of the Silk Road. This was a, a road that, uh, you know, theoretic road that developed in which trade was going across the Mongols because even though they brought war, once they defeated their enemies, they were actually quite tolerant. They were one of the most tolerant cultures that existed. They didn't have a problem with anybody's religion. You can practice any religion you wanted, as long as you were subservient to the empire, and in particular with Khan, the king of the, of the empire. But as a result, it had some stability. So if you were in good with the, the Khan, you were in good. You could do very well in terms of trading. Um, so they went across and they met up with Kublai Khan, also another figure that I think a lot of people have heard about. And his reign started pretty much when they, they left, which was 1260. And he was known as the, quote, Lord of the Tartars all, over all the earth and of all the kingdoms and provinces and territories of the vast and quarter of the world. On the side of, of interest, the, the Europeans never really quite referred to them as Mongols. They referred to them as Tartars. There's a lot of different theories of why this was the case. Uh, probably the most likely scenario is that there was actually a tribe of the Mongols called the Tartars. And when the Europeans heard about the Tartars, they associated it with the Roman term Tartus, which referred to the underworld. And then it all of a sudden made sense. There were a lot of people, and we, it, I can't underestimate or underemphasize how many people at this time really had end time kind of thoughts. They thought this was the end of the world. So all of a sudden they're hearing about these Tartars from the underworld, these demons coming across that can't be defeated. They really thought this, this was the end for them. Um, so it was kind of dire times and, and they were nervous. Um, going back to this picture, I think this picture is very interesting. This depicts uh, Niccolo and Maffeo Polo meeting Kublai Khan. And it just goes to show you how art can be sort of twisted into the, the perspective of the 
the artist. Okay, so this is clearly a European artist. There, I feel pretty confident. I don't know what Kublai Khan looked like. Usually, usually, this is the most famous kind of depiction of him. But I can pretty much guarantee he did not look like a, a really tall white guy. Okay. <laughs> the other thing to note with it is that there's a lot of religiosity in this picture, and that is something that's really important. It plays a role in my book as well. Is that even though these people were going across the steps and they were ostensibly trading and trying to make money, they were really thought of themselves as ambassadors for Christianity and they were bringing this kind of religion to, to people that didn't practice it. So it's not surprising that it's being depicted here and it might really have happened when it came to their interaction with Kublai Khan. Because if it's to be believed, nobody knows for certain, is that Kublai Khan loved them, thought they were great. Okay? He basically said, look, I really like what you're saying about this pope. He sounds like he's the kind of guy I might like. He seems like an important person. What I want you to do is go back home and send 100 men skilled in the seven liberal arts. So basically like Western education. Is this apocryphal? I mean, is this made up? Is it just to make them look better? Or is it real? I, it's, nobody knows for certain, but it's not unbelievable because like I said, the Mongols in general were not they were not reluctant to bring on other religions and other cultures. As long as it benefited them, they incorporated it. So they were kind of unique in that sense, and it's, it's kind of believable that this might have been something that would have been discussed. The other thing that's a little bit odd, and also kind of plays a role in my book, is that they, he also requested apparently oil from the lamp in the Church of the Sepulchre of Christ in Jerusalem. Um, why? I don't know, but I will say that most of these kind of items were uh, were associated with some type of healing property, something magical about it, and it's entirely possible that this was discussed. and And Kublai Khan said, "I want it. I want some of that because it's got powers in it." So what ends up happening is that the father and the uncle leave, and they return to Venice. And when they return, Marco is 15 years old, so he's they missed their whole, his whole childhood. They missed all the soccer games. <laughs> um, so they stay there for two years, and then when, when Marco is 17 years old, they leave. But this time, it's not just the two of them. It's the three of them. Okay? So they take Marco with them. And they initially travel to a city called Acre. And Acre is a city that's currently in northern Israel. And it was an important city because the, the, the Christians ruled Jerusalem for about 88 years. And then they lost Jerusalem. And in their retreat, they ended up in Acre. And they started fortifying their city, and that's basically as far as they got. So it was the closest you can get to like the Holy Land at that time if you were Christian, you know, unless you were really risking your life. There they met with a, a fellow named Tetelato Visconti. And he was an, an advisor, a legate to the Pope. And they discussed about what Kublai Khan had asked for. And Interestingly enough, this guy, the person they happen, they happen to meet, ends up becoming Pope Gregory X. And it's, it's a fortuitous thing for the Polos. I mean, how lucky are they that now they have a relationship with a guy that's now the Pope, like the most important person in, in, in Christian Europe. And apparently, they, they make an agreement, go back to, to Khan and go, first go get the oil. And I'm not sure how they got the oil, because it's like now in Muslim control. So they, they somehow figure out a way you know, to get the oil from, from the church, and then they start traveling. They did not travel with a hundred skilled, learned um, teachers. Instead, they got three monks that, at the first sign of trouble, uh, turned around and, and ran away. So it was just the three of them again. So they're traveling, you can imagine, just this like three people traveling across, you know, an incredibly dangerous area, and somehow they survive and they make it to Kublai Khan. This is a depiction of something from the Catalan Atlas. It was, um, it was created in 1375. Maps in those days were, were interesting because they weren't, it's not like using Google Maps now, which you want to get to a certain point. It almost told the story. So you get these geographic areas on a map that may or may not make sense, but they, they had areas that were really told historical events. So it was like reading a book at the same time and just looking at a map. And this is on, this is one of the most famous maps ever. Um, this is actually a depiction by the artist that made the map of Marco Polo's journey. So, um, you know, it was recognized even in the 1300s about, you know, what, 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 uh, what they achieved. So they, in 1275, they arrive at Xanadu. And Xanadu was the summer home of Kublai Khan. 
And just on another aside, um, right now there's a country called Mongolia, and there's no a lot of the descendants of the Mongols live in Mongolia. They don't only live there. Um, it's a pretty poor country. There's not a lot going on there. They have an indus their industry is mostly mining. Their life expectancy is quite low because of a lot of pollution. They use you know coal and wood fire in, in their house. There's a lot of you know respiratory issues. Um, but they've been trying to develop new economies, and one of the ones they've been trying to develop is tourism. They've, you know, they have a connection to this, you know, Genghis Khan. So if you were to go there, which I haven't, but, you know, I've read enough about it and it sort of plays a, you know, a role in my book, is that you, you can get Genghis Khan beer. That's a big thing there. They, you know, they want to promote that. But what's, what's kind of sad about the whole story for them is that just because of how the Mongols were, they, they're arguably, I would argue, they're the first sustainable people because they never formed cities that were permanent because they were nomads. So what they would do is they would build these yurts, these um, cloth tents, and they could be quite elaborate. And they would live in a certain area, and then they would pack everything up, and they would go somewhere else, and they'd pack everything up. So even Xanadu, which everybody you know, has heard about through the poem, it was the temporary kind of thing. They would just set it up and, and leave. And the problem with that is, like, if you're a tourist, you want to see the sites. You want to go to Rome. You want to go see the Colosseum. There's nothing like that. You know, other than a couple of rocks in some certain locations, so it is quite sad because they don't. Their, their industry is never going to have that, and even though they've built a big statue of Genghis Khan in the middle of nowhere, it, it's still modern. It's not. It's not from you know way back. Um, so they get to Xanadu, they speak to Kublai Khan, and if Marco is to be believed, they say, Kublai Khan says, "Wow, you, you know, your son is just terrific. You know, he is just the best." I don't want him to go home. I want him to stay with me and I want him to work with me as an advisor. Okay? And he does so for 17 years. So I'm going to get to a little bit about the book he wrote, but this is actually from his book, The Travels of Marco Polo, also known as The Book of Wonders. Um, and it's, it's quoted in my book. And what Marco wrote was, he said, from this point on, Nasser Marco Polo worked in the service of the Great Khan for some 17 years. He continually came and went from here to there often on secret missions, and sometimes he traveled for private matters, often with the consent of the great Khan. And thus it came to be that Messier Marco Polo obtained knowledge of a great number of countries and cultures of the world more than any other man. Okay, So when I read that, I thought, that's kind of amazing. I mean, it's amazing that he was there for 17 years, if that's to be believed. But he doesn't get very specific what he was doing for 17 years. He mentions that he was the governor of a Chinese city. That's pretty amazing, but there's no record in any Chinese city of anybody named Marco Polo being the governor. And you would think if you're like Caucasian living in China and you're like the governor of a city, you might get mentioned, not mentioned. So there's a lot of holes in Marco Polo's story. And there are some people, historians, believe he never even went to what he claimed. And this was all apocryphal and he made this up like a story. Um, so it's, it's very controversial, but it does raise the question that if, is, if he is to be believed and he was there for 17 years, what exactly did he do? And it goes back to that, that initial meeting with the Pope. He was, they were being sent out to, Mon, to meet the Mongols. It's not an unrealistic thing to think that if they were being sent out there, they might have had a mission, and maybe that mission might have been to be allies with the Mongols as opposed to be enemies. They knew that the Mongols had basically done, done a number on the Muslims, okay, and they were fighting against the Muslims. They didn't want a separate enemy, and wouldn't it be great if they had an ally of somebody, a, a people that were not exactly pro-Muslim, and they were very powerful. So a lot of this is really believable, but it raises the questions of what happened when he was, was, he, when he was there. The other interesting thing is that when the book is written, there's not a single map in the whole book. Here's a person that wrote a travel book. And you think about it, if, who would write a travel book and not actually have a map in it? And he doesn't. So the, all these maps that we have, you can find anywhere, you can Wikipedia, uh, basically are conjectures of where he traveled. But regardless of what map you look at, 
you can basically see for yourself, he traveled a lot. I mean, he basically went from all the way in Europe, all the way to Asia, down to the South Pacific, all the way around to where Sri Lanka was, and then all the way up to the Middle East. He was very well traveled, if he's to be believed, during this, this period of time. He returns in 1295 to Venice, where it gets even more interesting. So you have a guy that's been living for 17 years in the, in the Mongol Empire. He's got to come back looking kind of funny, probably dressed kind of funny, probably acting kind of funny. And he lives in Venice. Nobody mentions anything about him. There's no word about him, what, what he was doing there um, during that time period. There are some legends in which he comes back and he's dressed in Mongol robes and people are looking at him like, what, what's going on? And he tells them the story and they're like, we don't believe you. And then he takes out a knife and cuts the inner lining of his, his robe and all of a sudden gems and jewels fall out and they say, oh my God, it is true. And he, gets, he apparently gets the name Il Nion, which is like the millionaire, he's like the rich guy. But there's remarkably very little to, written about him, which kind of raises questions about how truthful any of this is. Either way, he ends up living in Venice for that period of time. There's a war breaks out between Genoa and Venice. He's on a boat. He gets captured and he gets put in, in jail. Okay. While he's in prison, he writes the Book of Wonders, which is also known as the Travels, Il Nion, there's all sorts of names. And it was basically the tale of when he went on this trip. He wrote it with the help of another prisoner named Rusticello, and he was, a, he was from Pisa, and he was like a minor writer. He used to write books like about chivalry and knights. So he's kind of a unique figure to be involved because he was writing a lot of semi-fiction, um, fantastical kind of stories. Marco ends up dying in, 12, uh, in 1324 at the age of 69, and his original manuscript has never been found. In fact, we don't even know what language it was written in. What we do know is that this preceded the, all this writing was before the, the printing press. So when a manuscript would be written, somebody would write it down by hand, they would pass it to somebody else, and they would write it, they would copy it, and each time they did that, there would be little mistakes, or somebody might embellish things. So we do know that there are manuscripts, and they're separated by time, and they can be quite different. So what is the truthful manuscript? We don't know. And like I said, we don't even know the language, that the original language of it. I will say that it was a bestseller, okay? Most people did not read, surprisingly, but of those that did read it, they really liked it. They, they really enjoyed it, so it was actually not an unread book. It was just being read by aristocrats. This picture right here is an example of a manuscript of Marco Polo's Book of Wonders. And this is the manuscript that Christopher Columbus had. And this is his copy, in which he actually, you can see that he wrote in the margins of the manuscript. And the, the, the story is that Mark, uh, Christopher Columbus only had two books on his trip. One was the Bible and one was Marco Polo's Travels. And it's, you can argue quite persuasively that Calista Columbus may never have made his trip and we may not be here in the way we are if it had not been for Marco Polo because if you think about what Christopher Columbus was doing is he was trying to recreate what Marco Polo was doing. He wanted to get to where Marco Polo was, got to but instead of using land he was going to use sea and the reason was war broke out at this time. In 1492 there was a war going on and you could not go by land to do these trade anymore. It was just too dangerous. So these, the, his book had really had a huge influence on, on, on explorers. So that's sort of the, the, sort of the background story uh, of, of Marco Polo. Um, my book deals with, with two central figures. One is named Eleanor Griffin, and she's a professor of, near antiqui of Eastern Antiquities and a postdoctorate student named Alexander Stone who studies medieval studies. And they get wrapped up in this mystery concerning Marco Polo. And it's a, a you know, like, like you had said, it's a fast-paced kind of cinematic story in which they basically need to unravel this mystery, um, much, much of which is based on truth and as much fact and research as I, I could, could find and whose implications can have a real profound effect on, on, on the rest of, of us um, once they discover it. I've gotten questions in terms of, well, where did I get this idea to, to, to write this book? And it really came from three different things, which is worth sharing. The first thing, which is at the beginning of my book, is a quote I came across. And I just thought it was just startling when I read it. And it was written by a Dominican friar, Jacobi de Acqui. 
And what had happened was is that, as we just so I sort of discussed, was that, you know, Marco comes back to Venice, and he comes back, obviously, if he did come back the way he said he did, certainly a changed man. He had different, certain experiences, and a lot of people probably didn't believe him. They thought he, maybe he made it up. So they didn't believe him. So what uh, Jacoby de Acqui said is, because there are many great and strange things in his book, which are reckoned past all credence, he was asked by his friends on his deathbed to correct it by removing everything that went beyond the facts, to which his reply was that he had, had not told one half of what he had actually seen. And I thought that was remarkable because a lot of the stuff in his book nobody had ever heard about. Nobody heard about rhinoceroses, or oil, or coal, or paper money. It was pretty amazing. And I thought to myself, well, if he only told half the story, what was the other half? And there were so many pieces of this jigsaw puzzle that didn't fit. It just didn't make sense. When you read his book, there's something not right about it. There's too many gaps in the story. It ends very abruptly. There's just a lot of stuff in there that just did not seem complete. And I thought, well, hmm, I wonder what that other 50% is. The other thing is, is that in 2004, my wife and I took a trip to Italy. And one of the places we went to was Venice. And I remember walking along the canals beautiful city, a lot of history, and you're looking down into these murky, dirty, kind of gross kind of canals, and I just thought, I wonder what stuff could have ended up there, underneath that water, just waiting to be discovered, either intentionally or unintentionally. And the third thing was really some of the fallout from the Iraq War, in particular, when, when everything kind of went south, and uh, there was looting of the museums of antiquities, a lot of items went missing. And I thought, well, how could that play into a story? Especially with Marco Polo, who was in this general, these kind of general areas. And of those, those three things, they sort of came together to, to lead to the creation of this mystery and trying to take all those kind of factors that were true and written about and piece them together in, in a believable kind of story that ultimately is fiction is obviously going to be something fantastical that's you know, going to be a payoff, but um, you, you read and you learn something about. So you know, before I conclude, I thought, let me just read a little bit of a passage so you have a feel for how, what the, the tone of the book is. And it's a very short passage, and it deals with an introduction to one of my main characters, which is Ellie Griffith. Um, she's a very strong character, um, certainly you know, in, in many ways the main character of the book. And it takes place in Mosul, Iraq in 2005. Okay. Ellie felt ridiculous. The oversized blue flak jacket dug into her thighs as she reached up to steady her helmet. The armored personnel carrier had temporarily come to a halt before suddenly lurching forward, nearly catapulting Ellie from her seat. White knuckled, she clung to the metal frame underneath her as she fought to steady her, herself and keep the growing nausea at bay. It's like heart of darkness, Gordon muttered, wiping beads of perspiration from his brow with the black and white handkerchief tied around his neck. To think, you fought tooth and nail to come with me. Two hours in a windowless tin can. Not a heck of a lot of glory. Having any second thoughts? Gordon cocked his head, slightly curling his lips into a wry smile. It was a smile she had become familiar with over the past couple of years. Ellie brushed back a strand of blonde hair and poked Gordon in the chest, shooting him a look of false indignation. Gordon, my dear, don't forget that Hamzi is my contact. Mark would still be searching the cellars of the Iraq Nas uh, National Museum without me. I think I earned this, don't you? I'm not a schoolgirl. Gordon nodded as he rubbed his brown beard, allowing the smile to temporarily dis reappear. Dr. Griffin, one thing I've learned quickly is that you are definitely no schoolgirl, and there is no convincing you otherwise once your mind is made up. You are as stubborn as they come. Stubborn, recalcitrant, pig-headed, and fixed in your ways were all things she had heard before during her days at Oxford. She had secretly enjoyed terrorizing the ancient white relics who filled the antiquity department, tenured and mired in old-fashioned ideas and theories. The, these tweed-wearing academics would invariably cross paths with the seemingly demure five-foot-four Brit and make a monumental miscalculation. Once challenged by Ellie, they would be left to putter around the university, greeting her entrance into her room with uncomfortable coughs and averted eyes. Such was the legacy of Eleanor Griffin. So that's just a little taste of, of who she is. I think you get a feel pretty, pretty quickly in terms of that she's a tough character. Um, but she goes along with uh, Alexander Stone, who's younger than her. Um, certainly a smart, smart guy. Um, 
a little bit awkward, I would say. And they go on this venture to try to solve this mystery that dates back well before Marco Polo and sort of extends beyond, beyond today. So that's all I wanted to sort of say. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer it at all. Yeah. Uh, the front of your book, what is that symbol? So I, it, it is a symbol that's in the book. I do not want to give it away. <laughs> To, but other than to say, yeah, other other than to say that um, throughout throughout history, symbols have played an important role in terms of religions. So this, I'm not giving away very much with this, but this is a cross, um, and they're all different types of crosses, and they all have different meanings and origins, and. Deciphering those particular crosses have a role in trying to figure out this mystery of, of, um, of that, like I said, is connected to Marco Polo but goes beyond him as well. But thanks, thanks for asking that. I'm glad you noticed it, but it, it is actually from the book. It's not just the design. Um, yes? So this is one of my favorite books that I read. It's really, it is a page turner. And I learned so much more about those people that I never knew before because that was not something I knew anything about. Um, can you talk a little bit about your process and how long this took you and what, what you went sure. through as far as the process of bringing it to this point? <laughs> yeah, well, thank, thank you for that question. Um, so it, it took a while. I would say it took about uh, two to maybe two to three years to write. It took a lot of research. But what happened was I was, after I finished fellowship, uh, I'm a doctor, and I, I finished the uh, fellowship. I. Uh, went, joined a practice at a hospital called Mount Auburn in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they had their own residency there, and I was on Harvard Medical Faculty as a clinical instructor. We had our own residence. And one of the advantages is you would get a, an ID for Harvard, <laughs> and I'm probably the only radiologist that ever used it for anything, um, but I, <laughs> my wife could attest that, and I would go down, everything was walking distance at that time, and I'd go to a library called Widener, which is this vast Harvard Library that has like a million books. It's like, you know, if you love books, it's like heaven. And I would take out every book I can about Marco Polo, you know, and then I would take out every book I can about the Mongols and I would just keep reading about it. And whenever I came across something that didn't make sense <clears throat> or kind of fit into this puzzle, I'd write it down and, and then gradually the story came to light. It's a very plot driven story. Um, it, 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 you know, I think it knows where it wants to go as you sort of reading it. Um, and like I said, I, I wrote it to be cinematic. I will say that it's very difficult writing a book in general, as, as you know yourself. Um, ideally, if I had my wish, I would just devote my time to writing a book and, and focus on it. But it's not my day job. I got young kids. I got a lot of things going on. So what would end up happening is I'd write as much as I can at night. And I will say it's hard to when you're a writer, you want things to be homogeneous, okay? And every day, your perspective changes. And if you wait too long, you forget what you wrote, and so then you have to reread it. And you just don't want it to be all over the place in terms of the voice that you have. So that's the most challenging thing. But I would say persistence, revision, so that you're going through it so that it's, it's, it's a level book. It's not changing day to day when you're writing it, when you're separating it by... You know, potentially two weeks. You may not touch it for two weeks, um, but that was the process I did. But you know, everybody's different in terms of how they they write, and every book's a bit different. You know, this this was a very heavily researched book. You know, it so it, it required a lot of just groundwork beforehand. But I know I didn't want to write a book, and there are plenty of books out there that are just complete fiction of that that are like books like this, in which nothing's true at all, and. You know, this is a product of, I guess, of Dan Brownish kind of writing. Um, look, I love Dan Brown, um, and and uh, you know, I think he he sort of he didn't invent the genre, let's face it, but he he certainly popularized it. And one of the great things that he did was because he had a lot of historically accurate things, it created a whole industry of taking that extra step to search for it. So you know, there are tourism in the industries you can go to like. Italy and learn about angels and demons and all the sites and see the statues and stuff like that. And I try to do that a bit with this um, as well because I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so every book's a bit different, but 
it required a lot of research at first, but once you had the research, then it was a matter of taking the story and fitting the pieces together so it made sense. I do want to say I do love the uh, cinematic aspect of it, mm -hmm. um, but you know your cliffhangers at the end, they did, they killed me. You know, <laughs> yeah. They're a real patron, yeah. you can't stop reading it. Yeah. But, um, but uh, I actually have a question about uh, Marco Polo's journey going to sure. uh, Mongolia. So how did he like have safe passage the whole way? I mean, it seems like something that, you know, be off right away. That's an excellent question. Um, so the Mongols were very advanced. You know, if, if, if you're a Game of Thrones fans, I think you are. Um, I'm pretty <laughs> certain that G.R.R. Martin based the Dothrakis on the Mongols. But there was that perception they're barbarians, right? They were not barbarians and they were very advanced. And one of the things they had was they, they had the Pony Express way before the Pony Express existed. And they also had safe passage by something called the Piazza. So if you were like a, a chosen person by the, by the Khan, you had a metal, a, a gold tablet that you would hang around your neck. And basically if somebody stopped you and they wanted to sort of mess with you, you'd basically show them the tablet and they'd say, oh, okay, you're a friend of the Khan. So he had one of those. Um, so that, that's how he theoretically avoided trouble. But he did leave Khan's court in, 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 in very, very quickly. So, and that plays a role in my book too. I mean, well, why do you leave all of a sudden after 17 years? You know, he just kind of fled. So what was the reason why for that? Maybe his safety wasn't insured. Just like with the Doge and the aristocrats and them having all this politics and danger that always was lurking around the corner when there's power, the Khans were no different. There were lots of sons and they were all competing against each other for power. And if you were on the wrong side of the equation, you know, you can be in big trouble. Um, and it's not unrealistic to think that, you know, Marco could have fallen on the wrong side at some point and he wasn't that safe and that, that kind of piazza wouldn't necessarily help him very much. So he, he got out of there in a, in a hurry at that point. Other questions? Chad, you yeah. say, many times I heard you say cinematic. Yes. So do you think there's a screenplay there? I, I mean, are you, you shopping it around? Do you know M. Mike Sha Shyamalan? <laughs> um, is he here yet? <laughs> no. um, uh, I mean, I, I, I look, I, I think it, I, you know, when I wrote it, I mean, it was written kind of from that perspective. Um, I think it could be adapted into a screenplay pretty easily, frankly. Um, you know, it's, it's all about, some of these things are all about luck and uh, you know taste you know things change in terms of what people are interested in i will say you know indiana jones the next movie's coming out harrison ford sign up so there's going to probably be new interest in it you know i will say you know if i must be honest you know the dan brown kind of craze kind of came and went at some point these things come in cycles and people kind of get interested in certain genres and, and then less interested and then interested again so um but we'll see you know there's a lot of a lot of mysteries that are in this book that are yet to be solved, and it's possible they could be solved in our lifetime, and it could engender a lot of interest. I will say, you know, Marco Polo perennially has people of interest in it. If you go to the bookstore, they're constantly reprinting his books. The, they have, there's books that just have photographs of his travels, like where he would have traveled. Um, there was a whole Netflix miniseries for a couple episodes that did quite well for a while on, on Marco Polo that kind of, it's very different than this, but kind of imagine like a young Marco Polo sort of. Um, so there's definitely a market for it, but like, as you can imagine, it's a very competitive market and I should be so lucky to have somebody interested in it. But, um, but I, I do think it would be easily adaptable towards it. I think of this almost mm. as historical fiction. And that's as popular as ever with all the book clubs and all that. Yeah. Um, it, it really is um, because people, like you said, anymore people are looking for truth. <laughs> and, and, and when they reach out, they want to also, they want to learn something. You yeah. know, whether you're seeing a film or, or reading a book, well, let me learn something while I'm here. You know, life is short. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's, I think you hit it. Like, I think people do want to read something and then feel as if, you know, how many times have you seen a movie that's, that's supposedly based on real life and it's really a far stretch? But the first thing you want to do is like, how much of that was true? It seems kind of crazy, that person's life, and you'll start looking that up. Um, and, and that's the same thing I wanted to achieve here. 
um, with that. So, so I agree. You know. And then you call it fiction, so that gives you artistic license. You yeah. Make up these people, but people can tell that that you've done your research. Yes. And, and they know your background. You know, and these books can be somewhat hard to pull off because, you know, if you think about all the Indiana Jones movies, um, you, you know, if you're going to write a book that's you know 400 and something pages, and you're investing all this time as an adventure, you need like a payoff that's going to be like worth your reading. And like, how do you pay off something that's that's you know other movies have come out and you know it's this or that, and you just you certainly wouldn't want to repeat that. So um, that's always a challenge, but. I mean, I think the ending is, is, is something that is, is worth the ride, you know, to get to it. And what about the sequel? So that's a good question. So the sequel, there is a sequel. It's written. Um, it hasn't been looked at in a while. Um, it's, it's, it's basically called, it involves some of the same characters. It was called The Jesus Project. It has to do with a um, mystery concerning the, Sh the Shroud of Turin. Um, you're familiar with that. And, yeah. and potentially some DNA that could be found on it and the implications for that. Um, I will say I put that aside because I, I've written some other stuff in the interim or, or after that and I've written a book called Boca which is a, a, a sort of comedy set in, in, in a, a gated community in Boca Raton. So very, very different and I just finished a, a book called Little Falls which is a, a black comedy that's a little bit more towards what I live through, um, which is it's black comedy about the healthcare industry. So I'm literally, it's done, I'm polishing it, and then I'm searching for an agent. So um, that's where I am with that. But like if this ends up you know, being a movie, then I will by all means go back and, and get that, that other book, you know, the sequel, completed. Yeah. In the description of your talk today, you mm -hmm. talked a little bit about finding a treasure somewhere in Venice under... Mm -hmm. Did you go into any of the current issues that Venice is dealing with? Yes. Yes. There's actually, the, the, there's a whole, I mean, it's a great question because that's, that's the central tenet of it, that Venice is sinking and um, the steps are tried taking to prevent it from sinking, sinking and that, I don't want to give away too much, has a role in the discovery and item that leads to the beginning of the of, of basically this kind of quest. So yes, and you know, and, and you know, you, you you can read the news pretty much on a weekly basis. I mean, look at that cruise ship that almost like you know took out the the pier in Venice. Um, that city is being destroyed, and even if they it wasn't a cruise ship that destroys it, it's just you know with climate change, once the waters rise, I mean, there's not going to be the ability to completely save that whole city. So see it now if you want to see it. But, um, but yes, the, those issues actually do play a role in the book. Um, I do feel like I was a little ahead of my time, I must say, because that was in like 2002 or something like that. I was sort of writing about that. Um, and it's definitely become more and more of an issue. So, so even and, before you went to Venice, you were already thinking about this Mm -hmm. Margot Paul, okay, because you yeah. said Venice was too bad. Yeah, and there's, even in the book, I'm not giving away anything again. I mean, it's one of these books, I don't want to give away too much because then it can ruin the whole story, but there's something called Mose, M-O-S-E, and it's a real thing in which they, to prevent the sea from essentially inundated the city, they're trying to construct these, these barriers, steel barriers at the bottom of the Adriatic, and what happens is if there's like a, a high tide or a lot of excess water, it rises up and essentially forms a wall like a breaker. Um, so these things are in the book, and you know I remember writing that. Like I said, I remember buying a book about the engineering of like dealing with the, the water issue, and I mean that was you know I don't know how many years ago, but it was a long time ago. And the same stuff is still going on. They haven't finished it, or you know Venice, like many things in Italy. If you've been to Italy, it, it takes forever for things to get done. Everybody's got a great idea, but it takes usually about you know 50 years longer than it should. So they're still still dealing with that. Any other questions? Well, well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you coming. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, Chad Brescher, The Lost Book of Wonders, and we're selling the book here tonight. So thank you all for coming. Such an interesting talk. And you did promise me that. So thank you very much. And Kevin from Studio 21 right here.
serving Radnor and Lower Marion Townships. <laughs> Give a plug for Studio 21. Thank you for recording this event. And thank you again for coming, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.